So um, my name is Chenta Lowry, and I'm a visual artist and teacher. I work primarily with wool and silk fibers, but I've also been uh, working with kappa over the last several years as well. Yeah, and I'm Art Medeiros, Dr. Art Medeiros. I'm a biologist here on Maui, and a collaborator with Chenta on her work. Well, I've worked for probably four decades, and probably don't, but people may not know that native plants like almost like native culture are endangered, not only native plants, but insects and birds and everything that go with them are on the edge. They say the edge of extinction, not being here tomorrow. Well, that's the truth with native plants. And so I've kind of worked my life in not only the study, but in maybe trying to doing some CPR on the aloha uh, and the relationship between plants and people. As a result of our work together, I created two pieces. And uh, one is made through a felting process. I hand felted it. It's this piece here. And felting is technically the matting together of fibers. It's the most ancient fiber craft form that we know of. There are examples of felted materials that date back to 6500 BC. Um, and the reason is that you don't, it doesn't require any tools. It's just moisture and friction that causes the fibers, wool fibers in particular, to mat together. Um, I've used two techniques. The uh, wet felting technique um, I used for the background as the base fabric. And then I've used a dry felting technique, which is a much more recent um, process because it uses a tool. It uses what's called a felting needle. Um, which are barbed needles, so they have the, the point at the end of the needle, but then there's also barbs coming off of the needle that go in the opposite direction. So when you, you poke the fiber, some wool fiber into a base fiber, a base, base cloth, the fibers are pushed down and then other fibers are brought up. So it causes the wool to adhere to itself. Um, so the background is all wet felted and then the detail of the figure and the, the color leaves are needle felted. The felting needle allows you to have a lot of control, so I'm basically drawing with, um, with the wool. What's nice about it is that it is inherently three-dimensional, so I can, um, you know, it's different from the drawing where you, it's the illusion of things, shapes overlapping. I can actually just overlap one leaf with the, the next or the next colors, and then I can push it down. I can allow for a lot of relief or not so much relief, depending on um, how, I, how I want the final uh, effect look to look. I'm very drawn to textures and um, there's a warmth and a, um, an intimacy that I feel I can achieve with the wool. Um, however, I don't usually work figuratively and I found it very challenging to work um, <laughs> as I was working figuratively here. I thought oh, it would be so much easier to just paint this and be so much faster. But, um, but it was a good challenge in the, in the way that, you know, as artists, we don't always set up challenges for ourselves to push us, and so I really appreciated this opportunity to, to push in that way. Um, yeah, I worked as a biologist with the federal government for 35 years before I retired to take a work as program manager for the Iwahi Project, because I hadn't seen a project where Native Forest was responding so well to protection efforts, restoration efforts. It was a forest that was pretty much the walking dead and we did things and the forest kind of came back to life progressively. I think you can feel the power of nature, first of all, which I don't know why, but it seems that maybe it's because you're helping nature, but there's something about an immediacy there. And there's also about a group of people gathering to do good things in the mountains. And it's, I don't know why, it's very powerful. So I've been doing it for decades now. And, and it is this idea, if you ask me, of what she's captured here, this idea of, I see this all the time with people looking at nature and saying, wow, you know, sometimes I say, oh, it's an antidote for email because it, 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 it's so quiet and it's so beautiful and it's so almost to me like, like art or like we imagine God to be. And so um, I think it enriches our life. And so some people say, oh, we're saving it, but I'm not sure we're saving it. Uh, there, there might be some mutual saving going on. You know, I came with all these ideas that I thought would, I would expand on through working with art and talking to him. But really, my, it was about this very intimate connection between the individual human spirit and, and the work with the earth. 
um, that I was trying to capture in this piece. For me, it is humbling that these ancient trees are some of the most ancient organisms on the island, right? I mean, they're all standing, they all saw, they all saw Hawaiians, native Hawaiians that had never known Europeans walk under them, you know? And they saw the passing of European ships. They saw the changes. They're the last survivors of old Maui. And people thought they're like fossils that can't be brought back. And so the idea of kind of building a house around them and having the babies come back, well, that's super exciting for me as a biologist. But to me, it's, it's actually not as exciting as seeing people care. Because I know that I'm going to pass away. And because I'm going to pass away, I won't be able to protect the forest anymore. If somebody has to. And so seeing that, seeing this thing happen, I mean, right now this is a cultural thing, but culture is the same way. There kind of has to be a kind of a cultural reignition. When you look at good art, you say, wow. And that's the way I feel in forests, except that it's a big wow because it surrounds you. You know, Chent and I are similar people, right? And Chent is an artist and she works with wool. I could have worked with wool. I work with plants and I went on a different voyage to be familiarity with the plants. and. When you develop familiarity, you want to protect them. And so our work come, kind of comes together. But, but I think both like the same thing. We're both trying to protect things that are Hawaiian, that are unique. We don't want everything to be swept away so rapidly by culture, I mean, these, by these cultural changes. So it's a little bit of that. And then I think there's a little bit with Chenta. For me, you know, the capturing of her inner spirit. And maybe that's kind of what Oahe is all about, too. Is, but there's a kind of a putting of something special here. The relationship between um, identity in place is important to me and I've been exploring it and I think that um, even though neither of us are Hawaiian, um, the values of a place um, are live deeply in us and I think in anyone depending on where you grow up and so um, you know I think of these three important Hawaiian values of uh, Malama Ika'ina which is what this is titled, caring for the land, caring for the place. Um, a concern about leaving whatever you do, how it affects the next generation, as Art just spoke about wanting to be sure, like after he passes, he's thinking about those who come after. Mm -hmm. Through my visit to Oahe, I it became clear that I needed to focus on the human element and, and the relationship between um, the individuals and the intimacy of the individual and nature. And so um, I portrayed Kala'au, who's an 11-year-old girl, um, in this piece. The piece is made of kappa um, through a very uh, traditional method, which I have been studying, and it's important for me to continue to um, process the valke in, in a traditional way. But I also have combined it with, combined it with um, a colored, colored pencil and embroidery representational image, which is not at all traditional. On the one side I have Ohia Lehua represented, uh, which is one of the most important ecologically and culturally significant species of um, the native Hawaiian forests. And so on the one side, on the right side, which is representing more hopefully the future, it's a, it's a hopeful, this piece is a hopeful um, image. It's meant to, it, it's a result of what the hope that I took away from my experience in the forest. And uh, Kala'au is a, a very special individual. I hope that Art will share more. Um, she's holding ripe Iea fruit, which um, I stole from this caption of a photograph that Art had posted, um, Rarer Than Gold. So the title of this piece is Rarer Than Gold, Kala'au with ripe I, Iea seed, uh, fruit. The forest is at such a point of loss when we got here that it's, for it to be here in a century, it's going to have to be reborn in a way. And it will be reborn through people like Kalao. Kalao is Kalao Kiyokamalie. So she has rooted into the land. She knows her native plants. She's free to identify them. Or, we, oh, that's a weed. Or this is that. And uh, so she, there's beauty in her. The other thing I'll say is that it's matched up with the Ohia. And to me, the fact that the Ohia is here, probably the most abundant tr native tree in Hawaii, and threatened by a disease that will decimate it. And so the question is, will the two of them be together again? I feel like it's, it's inspired a new body of work that I'm just at the beginning of, um, re related to the human connection and 
story with the land and identity and all of that. And, um, you know, I hope we work together again. I feel like we um, have access to each other in a, in a way that who knows what will come from it, but I think only good things. Hi, my name is Kudra Clover and I am a silk painter and I'm showing a piece of viewpoints and um, I was chosen to be on the Reaching Out project by Joelle and she asked me to select someone in our community and I chose my buddy Malik. Um, Malik is a healer and an acupuncture specialist and he owns the Dragon Den and he did a lot of healing on me, brought me back to health, probably why I'm alive today. But, <laughs> But you can explain more what you do. Um, my name is Malik Cotter. I live on Maui. I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine, oriental medicine, 40, 45 years now. Um, Beijing Medical School, Chengdu Medical University, living in China. And that's where I draw a lot of my inspiration from, from living over in the middle kingdom of China for about a dozen years or so. So Kudra and I are buddies. She asked me to get involved. Um, the way I live and the way I approach life is through a Taoist way, which is just basically being yourself, just being natural and getting rid of all the concepts you can. And this was, uh, this was challenging for me because I don't think I lived in the Tao before. I think I lived kind of chaotically, but um, this project helped me a lot. Kudra and I were talking about what's the Tao, and I just, and I said, you know, the first chapter of the Tao Te Ching, which is the classic of Taoist, Taoism. It says, um, the, the Tao that can be spoken is not the Tao, which means basically you can't put Tao or way. It's, it's, cinnamon. it's a synonym for um, the way, present, life, God, Allah, whatever term you want to use for the great source of life. The Tao is just another one of those synonyms. But I thought about it and I went, it's being present rather than being a person. Uh, and that kind of puts the Tao in a little bit of a eight word situation there because you're being present you're not following who you think you are you're not stuck into an ego identity and that's what the Tao is about it's about being in the moment letting life lead and spontaneously following just letting the inspiration the intuition and insight of right life bring you your revelations and just living in accordance with nature that's what the Tao is to me and I talked to Malik again and he's like um, yeah, of course you can't do it because you can't represent it. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, just go flow. So I did. I just put my canvas out and I just started flowing and spirals started coming out of me. And um, I like to paint a lot of nature stuff. I like to paint microscopic stuff. So I started painting spirals and I started seeing um, these little microscopic shell things that I've been researching, which are um, foraminophores, they're one-celled organisms. But then I noticed that they kind of look like galaxies. And in the Tao Te Ching, um, there's a chapter that says, um, you might have to help me with this, long defined short, big defined small. Um, you say it better than me. No, you, you got it, you <laughs> got it. It's like the yin-yang, the opposites, the push, the pull. So I didn't know if I was painting galaxies or microscopic galaxies. So that's kind of what this is. It's big and small. This is where I came in with Kudu just said. She was having a little challenge on not figuring out how to go about doing what. And it, it was so wonderful because the Tao is, is, is everything. It's, it's abstract and it's relative. It's concept and it's non-concept. And Kudra's trying to get this concept. She's trying to get this mental image. She's trying and searching her mind to find out how can I put this into a conceptual frame. And I'm like, no, you don't need boundaries. You don't need a conceptual frame. Just empty out and allow it to happen. Allow the Tao, or because this is what we're doing, allow it to come through you. Just let it happen. Don't even have to think about it. If you're tapped in, it's when, it's when the dancer becomes the dance, or the painter becomes the canvas, or the singer becomes the song. It's, it's when you're just being with what is, it happens. You don't have to think. The Tao can't be perceived. Small, it's smaller than an electron. It contains uncountable galaxies. And the Tao is the great mother, empty yet inexhaustible. It gives birth to infinite worlds. It is always present within you. And use it any way you want.
So, ta-da! <laughs> um, it's called Galaxia because, um, and I didn't know this until after I named it, but then I thought, I better look this up because this could mean like a video game Galaxia, <laughs> <laughs> which it is that too. But um, it is uh, in the New Age mother goddess corresponding to Gaia, but on a higher galactic level. Go figure, it means that. So my process is a, a mixture of a couple different kinds of silk painting. I do um, rosome, which uses wax, and I use resists. And this one mostly has resists, which um, kind of block off the parts. I used wax to push back some of the dye, hold it out. Um, normally with silk painting, you have to plan it out a lot because you can't make any mistakes. And if you, do, if you put a color down, even if it's yellow, you can't it's never going to be, if you try to put black over, it's never going to be the way that it's supposed to be. So this was really challenging because I'm trying to flow, but I'm trying not to plan it. And I'm trying to, so I would just do a part of it and then paint that and see what happens. Sit back, look at it, think about it, let it flow, and then add another part to it rather than sketch it all out and put it all on there and try to stick to it because then I'd be not in the Dow, right? <laughs> um, Let's see what else. I use um, salts and alcohols to get different effects. Oh, these kind of are interesting. These things, by the way, are also called uh, foraminophores. When I was thinking that these, these foraminophore spiral shell things were like galaxies, I'm like, well, I should put some stars in there because I need galaxies, right? I'm like, is there anything that's microscopic that's shaped like a star? And it turns out that these little creatures are actually also forums. They're the same creature, just in a different shape. I'm like, ah! <laughs> so, the sprinkling of stars to the galaxy. Actually, last night we were having tea and he's, we were like, you know what we should really do is just bring a canvas and start painting it there. That's really, that would have really been it, but I didn't get that. We didn't figure that out till last night. I'm like, well, I don't have time to get a canvas ready, but um, I'm gonna continue um, learning about it. I think it's gonna help my process to just relax and chill out because I'm kind of hyper. <laughs> 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 yeah. And maybe study with Malik because he teaches this. I gained a lot out of this, um, a lot of just the way we interface with one another. It helped me understand things and allow me to just accept what is. Um, I, I really appreciate Kudra. Uh, I went to an art show of hers and I saw these little microscopic creatures that I would see under a microscope, but I saw them up on, on the wall <coughs> like this and I was like, I like that. <laughs> I like seeing these blown up, magnified a million times from the microscope. That was something I, I also learned a new appreciation for. But being with Kudra really is just, it's an enlivening experience. She's full of life, she's full of bubbles, she's, she's a joy to be with, and it's infectious. Yeah. So it was just so easy to be with her and just to communicate. We sit and drink tea, we talk, we, we share ideas. She gives me what she's feeling. And it's interesting because she, she just mentioned a little while ago about how being in the Tao, and then she's thinking and planning, and that's not in the Tao. No, that's, that is the Tao. That is the Tao. It's just, yeah, you see? Oh, right. That's where the mind goes, that you're not doing what you're supposed to do. But no, it's just, that's the perfection of it. If we don't judge what happens, it just happens. And that's the beauty of working with Kudra, is we just went, went for it, shared time and energy, and a couple cups of tea here and there, and this is what we came up with. And I really enjoyed being with Kudra a lot. When I first looked at her piece, I looked at it with, with thought. And I went, oh, well, this is that, and this is nice, and I can see how you did this. And then I went, OK, that's nice. Now look at it without thought. And I went into it, and it captured me. It like sucked me right into it. And I didn't have to think about it. I felt it. It was a feeling more than an, more than an analyzing of what's happening with the painting and what it is. And more of a critiquing, it was more of just feeling it. And feeling the beauty of it, and feeling it, and how it, draw, it drew me in. And, and that was really special for me. Because I, I, I appreciate art. Um, the Impressionists are my favorite, and this is not so much the Impressionists, maybe a little Van Gogh or something, but, but um, it drew me in, and it created a feeling inside. And that feeling was calm, it was joyful, it was happy. I just, I just fell, I fell out of who I thought I was by going into this. I 
Hi, hi, I'm Gabby Anderman, and this is my daughter. Sabine Kale. Sabine Kale. And tell them how old you are. I'm eight. And I'm older than she is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we collaborated on this project together. We collaborated on these two. We're actually surrounded by our paintings. Uh, I got asked a few like months ago to do this um, show. And it, I was, I kept trying to think who, you know, what I wanted to do, who I wanted to collaborate with. And one morning I was walking in my house and I have a painting up that I did in 2010. And it was just after she was born. And it's a painting of me pregnant. And I'm looking very greenish gray and I'm pregnant and the baby inside is glowing. Um, but it's like a head that's sort of disjointed from the body and it's, it's, you know, me being pregnant and being nauseous the whole time when I was pregnant. And I thought, well, how interesting would that be if I, um, if we sort of revisited that work, but with the two of us and now she's out of my body and, uh, we just collaborated together on a painting. Um, and sort of use that as the inspiration. And so this was the first piece that we worked on together, um, which was sort of me in the same position as the original painting, but with her adding all of the, you know, all of her sort of additions to it. Um, and so that's what I decided to do. I decided to ask her if she wanted to collaborate with me on this project, and uh, it, we, we did, we started, you know, the next maybe a week after that or something working in the studio drawing and then painting and it sort of expanded and we started doing a few paintings and we started doing some small drawings together we yeah. did some drawings together I... yep yeah. yeah there's there's some of this stuff so then uh we started working together and just to describe the process she i gave her a blank sheet and she you just added i said draw on the sheet and so she started putting drawings in um, and you can see some of hers still peeking through. And then I would do some drawing on it. And then she got to paint on it. Yeah. And then I got to paint on it. And then she went back in and would draw. And then I would go back in and draw. And so we just collaborated back and forth, back and forth, until we got to the final project. Well, it was fun because I don't really ever get to work in the studio with her. And I never really get to work on huge pieces of paper. And yeah, it was fun. Yeah, I just did whatever came to my mind. So we knew from the beginning that it was sort of a mother-daughter sort of theme. And, um, but that she, I, I told her that she's free to do whatever comes to her because I wanted her to be able to just draw and create from her heart. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, the pencil is uh, our Prismacolors, and I just love Prismacolors. I, I have for years been working with those. They're really soft, and the, the colors are, they have a thousand colors. And so we started with Prismacolors, and then I also love to start with charcoal as well, so I use it with, um, various charcoal pencils, and she could use them too, but I don't think she used them much. She mostly used the Prismacolors. And then I work in acrylic, and I use some mediums as well. And so there's uh, some of the mediums that I use either extend the paint or add a grit to it. And then I also um, have been using lately spray paint. And so I've been using, um, and that's where you'll see some, some spray paint that, and I, I'll use lace and um, put that down. And I have other different kinds of um, stencils and things. But for this project, I used a lot of lace because somehow that was just coming to me. and. A lot in these, my mother um, was coming through as well. You know, my mom just passed two years ago, and I could feel like my grandmother, my mother, um, and Sabine. So it was like this mother-daughter thing, but it felt generational to me. This, I feel like, is the daughter piece, and this, I feel like, wound up being the mother piece, and uh, I gave them both these lace collars in the end. But those, those both started out as Sabine's idea. She is the one. Do you remember that you started with lace around her what? collar? When oh, you yeah. were doing this, you put lace around the collar, and I just continued with it. 
and uh -huh. finished the lace there, but that was all your idea. And I thought, oh, that's so great. To describe this, Sabine, you said you put this in there. What was that? No, yes. I love that you put that in there. What was that about? Oh, um, my mom and my pop-ups. I um, Mama and pop-up are her grandma and grandpa. I saw this painting and it said no, yes, all over it. And then I just wrote it up there. Who did that painting, the no, yes painting? You. Yeah. <laughs> so she was bringing in one of my paint. I didn't realize that, but she brought in one of my. And then this, we finished. She put this in around what? Halloween, right? Wait. And this was sort of. Oh, I think I put that part you in. You put the ears in and the sunglasses on. Well, it wasn't. It was more like a mask because for Halloween, what were you for Halloween? Kitty cat. A kitty cat. And this one also says. This one underneath it says, "Mother me." And this one says, daughter, me. And I don't know, for both pieces, I just felt like, yes, this is the daughter, this is the mother, but aren't we, like, we're all mother, daughter, mother, daughter, mother, daughter. And then, you know, then we become the grandmother and then we, we pass on. But it felt like they were both me and that this will eventually be her and this will eventually be her daughter. And so it just, I really felt that generational thing. And in this, she had put both eyes... Um, closed um, and she had done both eyes with the uh, you know you could see the lashes and they were closed and I wound up opening one eye because uh, that just felt to me like they're definitely at this age in a, like a dream state you know so the eyes closed and they're just you know in fantasy but also the eye open because just so alert and aware and part of this world so sort of halfway in between so I felt like that so this part here, um, I have a line coming from her mouth all the way down through to the belly. And in the original piece, I also had that. And it was sort of this connection of the, you know, me coming through the belly, but there's also the breath. And I, I feel like that, you know, in, um, in Hawaii, you know, the aloha and the breath and giving life through the breath. And that's in so many traditions, I feel like, that life is given through the breath. Um, and, and so just con that connection somehow keeps coming through a lot of my paintings um, to connect, you know, the her with, with me and that cycle, you know, just like just our, our connection that we have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then other things, you know, like the, I, I put masks on both of them. That's like a huge theme that I have going through a lot of my work. And it's just sort of the masks that we wear all the time in life that we're constantly, um, you know, sort of behind masks. Um, and in childhood that that isn't, you know, happening. Probably why I just did like a half of a mask here, you know, because in child, you know, we're just developing those masks that we wear around all the time. So oh, my favorite part is the cat ears. Why? Because um, I love cats. <laughs> and what's your favorite thing about this piece? Um, I like, I like her mask. It's why? cool. Because it's all blue, and it's pretty, and I like it, yeah. I like working with my mom because it was fun, and um, there we could use all of the um, colors and stuff, and like mm, all different sizes of paper and stuff like that. Yeah, it was fun. Picasso once said that um, it took him a lifetime to learn to draw like a child. She, I let her start both of the pieces, and then I would let her put her stuff in, and then I was learning from it. Like, oh yeah, don't be so tight. Allow it to, you know, use a different um, medium in there. Like, and her painting that she did in here, this green and this purple, I, I couldn't even touch it because it was so perfect. The way that she did it, perfect in its imperfection. I think I want to be an artist when I grow up. You do? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Right, I'm George Allen, and uh, I'm the painter of this thing, the paint. 
Um, this is Bradley, my stepson, and he did a lot of the construction of, it's kind of complicated back there, but in an easy sort of way. But uh, he came up with all that, and he coordinated the, um, most of, uh, when, when we, we had a hard time getting the fish to swim and all that stuff. They just didn't want to do anything. So Brad came up one day and sorted it all out. And I, I couldn't figure it out. Hi, I'm Brad Pitkin, and um, I'm, I work for a general contractor, so I kind of have troubleshooting skills somewhat. Um, and I'm George's stepson. And, um, you know, this was a collaboration between George with the, the whole idea of the concept. My younger sister, Lisa, and her husband, Andrew, who are video production, they, they have a pr video production company. They did the video, and I connected the wires and made the <laughs> video work. <laughs> yeah. Because Lisa and Andrew, of course, they live in uh, Washington State, and they're off all over the world with uh, doing videos. They're never at home. And so they were very little help in a way getting the whole thing to, to work. And they, they sent us the film. When you first dreamed this whole show up, uh, we were on a cruise and uh, we had fun just talking about possibilities that we could do and uh, we threw a lot of ideas out, I mean really out, and, and then uh, um, we came up roughly with this, I think, and uh, then it just went from there slowly, you know. Um, the first thing we got was the video from Lisa and Andrew, a preliminary one just to see what it looked like. And then uh, they sent better ones, uh, and, and, uh, and I, I started, I bought this plexiglass and a TV set. I thought, well, that's my start of it. <laughs> and I started to paint on the plexiglass, and Brad helped me with the frame and uh, connecting it to the TV set. And uh, oh, it's a real collaboration. Yeah. yeah, but the idea was really George and my younger sister. They came up with the concept of this. Well, I didn't yeah. even, they were describing it. I had no idea what they were even describing, really. Really? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> we, had so. a lot of, we had a lot of laughs about it on that boat. Okay, I, I was drawn to the idea because of um, my connection with Koi. I mean, in involved with them for many years. We've had a koi pond at our house for, I think it's 22 years. And, um, and the first time I ever started painting koi was for a big show. And uh, w we were in Ala Moana Centre, me and Janet. Uh, and there's this big um, koi pond in the middle of the mall, you know, and all these beautiful koi floating around. So I took a lot of photographs and I did paintings of them. I, I loved them. I thought oh, this is a really great thing. And um, I did a big one for that show. And I've been painting them ever since. Like with painting, doing a painting, you just slap it on and that's that. You know, the edges don't matter much, not as much. This thing is all edges. So you have to be careful. Speaking of the painted portion, there was an added technical challenge in that some very important instructions that came across the TV oh, were yeah. covered by lily pads <laughs> throughout the process. Yeah. So yeah. we had to overcome that too. So I thought this is really a meditation and so that's how we came up with the name. But it is very calming. When I was a teenager and George first came into our lives. And um, <clears throat> I was a typical teenager in Lahaina. So, you know, George had his hands full. But he would pull me in and into the studio. And I, I don't know, one, that, one project that comes to mind is that you were commissioned by a restaurant, 
a Mexican restaurant to do a um, what what was going to look like a stained glass window with a with a you know some kind of a scene going on in it, and you did it all with resin, yeah, and colored resin and. And it was a, you know, I could tell that it was a, it was a learning process for you. It yeah, was something it was. that you it had was. never really yeah. done before. So, you know, we were both in there mixing resin up. We mixed one batch of resin, I remember, that burst into flames. <laughs> so, you know, it was a learning process. One of the big problems was Lisa and Andrew were in England, or, well, you know, for the last couple of weeks. And so we were phoning them all the time in England and they were and of course when it's twelve o'clock here it's ten o'clock at night there or something, you know, it never it's never it's never easy. And they sent a whole new what do you call that, a start up system? Well it just it it wouldn't work from the thumb drive off the T V that ha the T V has a thumb drive media player capability. But unfortunately, it wasn't powerful enough, and the fish kept stopping. Yeah. So the yeah. video would go for 10 seconds, and then the fish would stop. <laughs> and then they would resume. So Lisa and Andrew had to troubleshoot what components were really needed, and we had to step up to having an actual media player back here yeah. that, uh, that the video is driven by. Like I said, I was reading instruction manuals. That's all I was doing. They were sending the, the parts and the pieces, and I just read the manuals and I might plugged this you. in here, plugged that in there. We kind of, in <clears throat> collaborating in the past, make a fairly good mix because he's uber creative, and I'm, you know, I, I'm more logical about stuff. I, I want to, I'm very utilitarian. Things have to work. They have to work properly. Ahead of aesthetics yeah. for me. So, you know, <laughs> somewhere in between the two of us is the perfect person. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I've done a lot of kind of 3D things for different shows, you know, at the Mac and different places. And I've always known what I was going to do. Brad helped me with a lot of them too. I've always known what I was going to do and you just carry through and you, you're done in two weeks max. This one, it just went on and on and on because <laughs> I didn't know exactly how it was going to work. And um, so I, I lost a lot of sleep. I didn't sleep very well while all this was going on. And I'm very relieved to, come here and see it up on the wall and working. Yeah, like I, I, would, I would echo that. I mean, it was a challenging thing to be involved in as little as I was involved in it because I couldn't envision it. I don't have nearly the creative mindset that George and even my little sister have who really came up with the concept. So for the longest time until I actually saw the parts, I really had no idea what we were all talking about here um, and and then you know and then it just became challenging for everybody to get together or you know to get the parts we needed from Lisa and um, make them work and then they didn't work at first and there were <laughs> you know there were issues we had to get through um, yeah. but all's well that ends well <laughs> it's always good to, to work with him and Lisa and Andrew. I mean, it's fun when, when we're doing, oh, well, when we're together, you know, and doing stuff. Um, so it was good for me to, to, you know, collaborate and I got a lot out of that. Brings us closer. Yeah. Well. Yeah, and, and like we said, you know, despite the challenges and the sleepless nights, you know, the end product turned out pretty well, so. When the 
as a collaboration, like for this piece starts. In this case, it really started many years ago when some of my first collectors and supporters asked me if I would take their daughter Lizzie in the, to be with me for, for a little while to get the sense of what it is to be an artist, what is the life of an artist. So she came in and stayed with me and that was the start of everything. Many years later, I received a Christmas card and it said, guess what, my daughter, Aiden, is becoming an artist. And therefore, I couldn't help saying, well, she has to come and spend some time with me. And this was really the start of this artwork. Uh, including the fact that at the same time I was thinking about bringing my goddaughter to Maui for the summer and it kind of became a thing in my mind that well how would that be if the three of us would do a piece of artwork. Je m'appelle Léane Chichporti, je suis la filleule de Joël et j'habite dans la banlieue parisienne. Ça fait donc un mois que je suis ici, c'est la troisième fois que je viens à Hawaï et depuis le début du mois, on a commencé un projet artistique avec Joël et Eden. Pendant les plusieurs marches qu'on a réalisées, j'ai pris beaucoup de photos et à partir de ces photos, j'ai fait aussi beaucoup de dessins. Je pensais que je ne savais pas dessiner, mais Joël, en voyant mes dessins, m'a dit que c'était plutôt bien, alors que pour moi, je ne trouvais, enfin, je me pensais pas soi-disant douée. Mais euh, moi, à la base, euh, je, je ne dessine pas. En fait, j'aime la musique. Mais grâce à elle, en fait, elles m'ont fait apprécier euh, le dessin et l'art. Nous avons donc réalisé plusieurs pièces. Mais dans la pièce principale, j'ai inséré ma passion pour la musique à base de notes, de musique, d'accords et plein de choses se rapportant à la musique. Je pense que toutes les activités qu'on a fait euh, organisées par Joël ont été très intéressantes pour nous trois. Mais euh, pour, du côté de l'art, mais elles nous ont surtout rapprochés euh, en tant que comme une petite famille. Um, I'm Aiden Conley. I'm 19, um, and I go to school at the Rhode Island School of Design. And um, I actually met Joelle through my grandparents, who were one of Joelle's first patrons. Now that I'm becoming an artist, I think it was very helpful. Like Joelle reached out and kind of jokingly asked if. Um, like I could come over and stay with her for the summer and kind of work on a project together. So actually working with uh, Joelle on this project has been really, really helpful, like to kind of show me the business side of things as well as like a lot of um, like techniques. It's been really like good experience for me to like meet a lot of the artists. Like um, Joelle actually has a teacher that I got to meet um, and like he taught me things about color that like I didn't know about before and it, it's been really cool because we kind of balanced like working and kind of play like I mean we've been on hikes and like swam and waterfalls and everything it's been kind of crazy um, but like in a sense it was all kind of it had to do with our work too because that we're capturing our experience so in total like my summer has really been amazing here like I think it's really been an experience of growth for me um, and kind of getting my life in like a healthy space where it didn't, it wasn't really going there before. Um, and I'm very grateful to Joelle. And like, I'm, I, I really enjoyed the summer and it's, it's gonna be one to remember for a while. The way I handled the idea of working in a, on a piece of artwork with two young girls like Leanne, who is 13 years old, 13 and a half years old she was, and Eden, 19 years old, I, I wanted to capture their innocence, their spontaneity, uh, and all uh, what they had, that I had maybe lost a little bit. <laughs> and so I, I had two projects that I started with them. One of them was 
I just told them, okay, take a piece of wood, a plank, and do whatever you want on it. Actually, I kind of got them into the idea of doing some carving, which is my specialty. And I say, okay, experiment. Don't worry about it. This is not the artwork. This is just for you to play. And the, on the other side, I asked them to work on some drawings, drawings that were inspired by Hawaii and inspired by uh, the native environment. I took them on a hike um, at New Refuge, where they could really get in touch with the um, the nature as it used to be in Hawaii. And we took some pictures, we did some research, and they ended up doing some beautiful drawings, uh, which to their, to my surprise and their own surprise, because they both said they couldn't draw, um, they were, they were really beautiful to my eyes anyway. And it's from those drawings that I drew from, but mostly what was really interesting is that the, the centerpiece here was actually the plank, the scrap wood that I had given them to play with. And when I saw what they were doing there, I was enamored by the work they were doing. I was really, that was for me, it. That was what I was really looking for. And they had no idea because they, in their wildest dream, they didn't think that was going to be part of the artwork. It reminded me of a painting by Vasily Kandinsky, which I don't know why it just popped up in my mind. And Kandinsky, I actually just recently find out, found out that he was creating um, painting, thinking about music. What is really interesting is that Leanne is really a musician. And I think that I must have felt something coming true. Of course, she, Leanne was the one that would imagine coming, and he, she was thinking about the song. She put all the mu musical notes and all that. I, I was surprised to find out that Kandinsky actually was thinking of that when he was doing his first abstract painting. Surprisingly enough, I would say 85%, 90% of every drawing in this painting was theirs. And the only elements that I brought in were more the abstract elements uh, from Kandinsky, like, for example, this here is one of my favorite elements in the Kandinsky painting, which is uh, a triangle and a circle. And I think it, it kind of represents what we did together. Uh, the triangle is the three of us, and the circle is coming together. I have on the right hand here, with the bird flying, I have those little dot patterns that are, they represent the seeds. They are like the seeds of what they're taking with them. So I made it kind of like a storyboard, you know, and it represents that summer that we spent together, a, a lot of fun, you know, it's not all work. <laughs> but also a sense that we, the three of us, uh, coming from Paris, New York, Hawaii, could work together and enjoy it and be enriched by it. I felt my task was to give them a little bit of guidance, but mostly stay out of the way. As I was working with their creation, it became clear that their individual personalities were totally expressed right there. And the artwork became a testimony of the interaction during the summer 
the real connection that we were developing. And I severed the process of finishing the artwork as I had to be out of my own story as a painter and let the painting become and follow the creative space those girls had given me to work with. We are Ray Bella, Raymond Molinet, and Gabriella Bella. And this is our illustrious partner, Wide Garcia, who is our inspiration for the two pieces that we have, that we've contributed to this wonderful Reach Out show. Raymond and I, we work as a team from the start because our entire relationship, we are married, and our entire relationship is about collaboration. And so we found at the very start of our relationship that we can produce much better results when we work hand in hand, when we collaborate mm -hmm. as a team and both bring in, you know, the best of each individual skill. That forms literally a synergy. So I couldn't do the art we do on my own, nor could he, but together we produce things that are impossible to create individually. I'm uh, White Garcia, and uh, I'm uh, from California, but I moved to Hawaii in 1974. And to my surprise, and not to my surprise, was that until 2016, I didn't even know there was an Aloha Spirit Law. And I started asking people about, did you know there was an Aloha Spirit Law? No, no one has ever heard of it except the people that created the law. So I want to give you the background of how this Aloha law became up into being, or into our knowing right now. There was a woman named Pilahi Paki, born in Kanapali in 1910. And she became a kahuna, or a priest in the Hawaiian religion, uh, by training in Makawa in, uh, in the 19. Hundreds uh, in 1970s and between, before. So she was a, a master of lomi lomi and so many things, so many skills. But she was also given the title Keeper of the Hawaiian Secrets. So in 1970, she had a vision that the world would be in terrible strife in the 21st century and that the people all around the world would need to look to the is islands of Hawaii to heal the world. And she died in 1983, three years before the actual law became into effect. That was in 1986. But she wrote the law. The words in this painting, the words in, in, in the law itself are all written by Pilahi Paki. But it was her contribution that gave me the awareness finally in 2016 and I started looking up and Googling it, and yeah, there's the law. I also found out a lot about Pilahi Paki. And in doing so, I became uh, inspired. Uh, I just got on fire with this whole concept of we can do this. We can actually heal the world with this. We can have a shift in consciousness because of this. We cannot, uh, the law is not enforceable. I cannot call 911 and say, hey, you didn't return a smile to me, and you should be arrested. But we can look at the law, embrace the law, and change our consciousness. And by doing that, all the people that come here to Hawaii and have lived here and travel can become ambassadors to this Aloha Spirit Law. What is Aloha? Before you can have Aloha, you must do Aloha. Before you can be Aloha, you must choose Aloha. Before you can choose aloha, you must have the power to choose. Before you have the power to choose, you must be the source of power. Before being the source of power, you must be conscious of the source. This is the Aloha Spirit Law written by Auntie Pilahi Paki. Akahai, the A in Aloha, stands for kindness to be expressed with tenderness. Lokahi stands for unity to be expressed with harmony. 
Olu Olu stands for agreeable, to be expressed with pleasantness. Ha'a Ha'a stands for humility, to be expressed with modesty. And Ahonui stands for patience, to be expressed with perseverance. Yeah, we chose um, a very contemporary style for one painting. One of the reasons for the colors was inspired by White's eyes. When he came um, and spoke to us the first time, there was a moment where the sun was shining in his face and this blue color of his eyes, because it's not really a color that I like to use blue somehow, but it had this color of ha wai, ha, the breath of life, and wai is the water. So it was literally the inspiration where I said it, we have to find all the layers that are in his eyes. The man is so multifaceted. So this painting has lots and lots and lots of layers, but we still did it very soft and with simplicity, which is exactly who White is. That's what he taught us. And we used the words of the Aloha Spirit Law, and we had conversations about what that really means nowadays. Olu Olu, for instance, agreeable to be expressed with pleasantness. What does it really mean? I had a hard time finding it out. It was like, agreeable? Do I have to agree with everybody? And White says, no. But if you d disagree, be pleasant about it. Be kind about it. And be really joyful about it. When we work on a painting, it's not just the technique of putting the, the paint on the canvas. It's the fact that our intention, our, um, our mana, is actually expressed through what we're doing. So because we know the importance of how energy works, and so we want to make sure that when we're touching it, when we're putting our energy onto this, that <clears throat> it's reflecting the spirit of aloha. Also, on the other side, as each and every of our paintings has something on the back, we know that everything that is on a painting is speaking to the person who is viewing it. So, on the other side is what we call an energy tattoo. It's not about hanging the painting two ways, but it's about having the hidden message come through the painting. And also on the other, uh, other side is um, a poem that I wrote when I met White Garcia. And it's a poem about the man with a golden heart and purple hair that introduced us to the biggest secret that Hawaiian people can give to the world. On this particular piece here, as you can see, there's the reference to the Hawaiian islands. And in that, we know that it's going to begin here. And what is in the back of this painting is a nautical star compass. And uh, it's a representation of the fact that the Aloha Spirit Law needs to be embraced and shared throughout the world. And so that was our representation that, um, that it will be shared globally through all voyages, through all uh, travels and that this important message will be conveyed because uh, it's profound uh, in its simplicity. And if we can just embrace that and realize that every response, every inquiry, every delivery to another human being embraces the Aloha Spirit Law. And it's not only important to use only one of the words that are in the law, but to use all of them. Because Antipaki says, if you use not all of them, you don't use any one of them either. So it's really about learning to incorporate how can I be kind, how can I be in unity, in oneness, how can I be um, agreeable, how can I be modest with humility, and how can I be patient and still persevere. And that in our daily life, that is our task in order for us to embrace this law. The experience of uh, working in this greater collaboration, we're used to working in collaboration, but uh, to include WIDE as our uh, spiritual anchor uh, in this project was really significant. And 
there were no um, challenges or obstacles. It was more expansion. And we all were expanding because we were embracing the Aloha spirit in what we were doing. And there was just this euphoric feeling that came over us when we were together and collaborating on this that, you know, it was, it was very special and there were, the, the challenge was to honor Antipaki and the Aloha Spirit Law, to honor Wide in his diligence and his, uh, really his dedication to making this known to the world. And so it was, in the, again, no challenge, but really understanding the, uh, the responsibility of the words that we were conveying. I'm Terry Lopez, and I'm a local artist here on Maui. And I love teaching art and being part of the art community. And I'm always looking for um, new ways to interpret my art. So this show came up, the collaboration show, and it get, I was thinking in my head, this is giving me a great idea to collaborate with an architect. So I talked to Peter. I had met Peter in a different little art class we took together, portrait class, actually. And uh, this is Peter Neese. He's an architect here on Maui. Hi, Peter Neese. Um, born and raised here, local architect, owner of Maui Architectural Group. And I've always loved being creative. Went to Haleakala Waldorf and then Seabury. And Terry came into my office after I'd taken a class that she was leading. My mom and I went and took it. And she asked if I would be willing to collaborate and create some pieces of art together. And I looked at all my work and I said, yes, let's do this. <laughs> let's make it happen. I wasn't really sure how this was going to all fit together because putting just plunking down a house plan or something didn't quite fit. And then I was thinking, well, maybe I should do some paintings, like paint a little plantation house, because I think all artists here on Maui love, it's kind of romantic a little bit, but the plantation houses are disappearing, but they have such a history at the same time. So I'm thinking, how can we make this interesting? So I was really drawn to how much of an art form being an architect is. He has to listen to his clients, somehow pull all their ideas together, but also the, deal with the environment. Think of the site where he's at. like. Which way does it, does the sun come, the wind come, the, where's the view? And pull all that together. So anyway, in doing that, while he's talking to his clients, he comes up with these little thought bubbles. Like, say for example, your friends uh, have a family, a young family here on Maui, and they have a couple kids. And why don't you talk about that process? Probably the most enjoyable part of the process, the design, initial schematic design concept, um, it's where you get to be the most creative. And we'll sit there and just list all of their wants, their dream house, what's everything that they would like to have. And then we'll start talking about the relationships of spaces to each other and how they want to live in the space and how they want to wake up and drink their coffee and what are they going to do when they get home from work. And just, it's so different with every person and every project that it, what I love about my job probably the most is that it's always changing, always different. And then when you factor in all different building materials and the possibilities, it's just limitless. And then, you know, it's like I had done a little research getting ready for this project. And so I had specifically with Dickie. And so that's why we have one piece that's pretty much devoted to him and it's um, Charles W. Dickey. And what's interesting about him, which I never knew, I knew he designed a lot of buildings. He'd been in Hawaii, had a, a part of an architectural firm with Hart, and then came and did all these buildings in Maui as well, like the Wailuku Library, the old lava, the beautiful old buildings. So the, the first thing is tr we're, we're sitting here looking at these beautiful sketchbooks, the two of us together, and I had this idea like, okay, well, how 
Are we going to copy these? Are you going to redraw them? How are we going to make this happen? And then also, which medium, which form is it going to take? Are we going to work with acrylic, maybe a resin piece, maybe, I don't know, I kept thinking, oil, no, that's not going to work. And so we came up with the encaustic idea. I said, you know, if I use encaustic and real pure color, I can create environments because the whole point of the architecture in the environment. It's the two things together. So use colors that are representative of Hawaii. So we got the blues, which is the ocean, a couple shades of blue. The greens, which is we all think of cane fields, even though we're starting to lose them, but it's still part of Hawaii. And then the rust, the red dirt colors, the golds and the browns. So just those three colors, that's it. And some white, white space, where we could put these drawings in there. And then, okay, so we thought if we use encaustic wax to get the color, then how are we going to get the drawings in there and which drawings and how are we going to do this? So we decided on Silk Gampy because it's so forgiving. You can print on it, you can paint on it, you can draw on it. So we did those three things. There's a few places, some of the pieces have hand done drawings that Peter did right on the Silk Gampy tissue. Some of them, uh, there's a, a painting, a little painting that I did of a house in one of them, the Dickey piece. There's a little house in the background. We painted on the silk gampy and did a couple of them, a couple colors, trying to make sure that it would integrate together. And then, um, and then Peter, we started using the silk gampy. You can print, you can make copies right out of the sketchbook with the intent of keeping that freshness. Because sometimes when you try and copy, I think something you've already done so beautifully, that freshness leaves. And so trying to keep that also, that element, the freshness, we decided to um, copy them using onto the Gampy silk and then rip apart the Gampy, the, the little images that we have, the colored versus the floor plan, black and whites, and move them around and try and find a way to integrate them. And in that process, we found out there's big parts and little parts, the big parts being the big finished plans and the little parts being the thought bubbles, the, the little special elements, the little roof detail that you're talking about or the a window detail. And so we kind of found a bridge between the real organic form of the encaustic wax and then the static floor plans. We put all these little pieces in. Another piece we did was the um, we, a thing we found with a bridge was the plants. That was kind of funny. We thought, oh, this looks really good. There's a little coconut tree that's been dr that you drew in, and and I don't know. It just it all seemed to kind of come together. You did drawings of the templates, the little that the architects use. We put those in there too. A couple things that really stood out in my mind when I was first approached this project was the split pitch rough, and also the stone work that's almost craftsman style that you see a lot in Honolulu and up in Manoa, those old houses, but they're done out of lava rock. And this piece is called Rock Solid, which we were like, what are we gonna call all these? And I thought, that's so appropriate. Speaking of the templates thing, this is our design template that we put plumbing fixtures in with. So these are all, it's just a fun way to add character and it almost feels like it could be tribal or tattoo like, and yeah, just, it made sense in its own way. It was so fun. I think, I think the other thing, n never mind challenges, it was all so good, so wonderful, but having Peter share his sketchbooks with me, because a lot of people, their sketchbooks, kind of your soul. You know, it's bared right there, it's your thoughts right there on the page. Looking through them going, these are so wonderful. The little thought bubbles, he calls them, where he puts the little circles together, the bedrooms and the kitchens, and just, you know, we want the bedrooms over here, and we want this one over here. And, and it's before it becomes a plan. And I, th I saw that and I went, oh, this is so wonderful. We can do something with this. Wasn't quite sure what. So that was our process. It kind of like evolved. I kind of went in with an idea, but then it evolved into something else. Things that were beneficial is pretty much everything about the whole process, just from Terry stopping in and us getting more and more excited, like, okay, yeah, we're gonna do this. Let's talk about it. And going home and being able to think about something besides 
oh, this project, I need to do this, and oh, I actually need to do laundry sometime. All of a sudden, I was like, wait, I need to be creative. And it was, that was actually, going back to what was tricky, for me to loosen up and just get out of drawing all the sharp technical bits, was, that was a hard, it was hard for me to be like, hey, just let go and go back to being more free with your everything, creativity and, and how you're drawing and just loosen up. I think any time you go through a process like that, you come away so much more enriched. And I think for me, it was getting to understand the architectural process. I thought I knew what it was. I had no idea. I found out later, you know? And then I just realized, and I knew he was artistic because I'd been in this class with him and talked to him a little bit. But just to really um, come away with seeing what he goes through, I, I came away totally enriched. And to kind of work together with somebody who's, he's, Peter's like, my kid's age, you know, and it's like so wonderful that we're all, we all know each other, they all know him, you know, went to school together and it's just, I think it's a wonderful bridge um, for us, for me. And um, thank you, Peter. Awesome. It was, thanks for doing this with me. Thank it was you. so great. <laughs> thank you.